Good morning. I'm Joanne Myers, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you for beginning your day with us. Our speaker, Tom Wheeler, is a man who has worn many hats. Most recently, he was chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, but before taking on that position, he helped start or was responsible for founding several companies offering new cable, wireless, and video communication services. Currently, he's a visiting fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. But that's not all. He is also a noted historian of the Civil War, and his two books on this period, Take Command, Leadership Lessons from the Civil War, and Mr. Lincoln's Tea Mills, How Abraham Lincoln Used the Telegraph to Win the Civil War, reflect his deep interest in how past events and present trends reflect, or don't, what happened long ago. It's not surprising, then, that the theme of his most recent book, From Gutenberg to Google, The History of Our Future, looks at how network revolutions of the past have shaped the present and set the stage for the future. It is a perfect vehicle for Tom to combine his passion for history with his experience in communications. Uh, just a brief footnote. When you hear the word network used today, it is being used as a shorthand way for describing the physical links that bind society together. In an age of smartphones, smart appliances, smart watches, drones, and driverless cars, it's easy to think that new technology is disruptive as it revolutionizes our lives in unprecedented ways. History, however, tells us a very different story as life-changing innovations just didn't happen. The free flow of information began a long time ago. As many of you know, the original network revolution began in the 15th century with the invention of the printing press. Four centuries later, the great network-given transformation appeared when the telegraph and the railroads came into being, thus drawing people closer than ever. You could say that the benefits of connectivity were realized at last. Now as we enter the third network revolution, our speaker tells us that the disruptive nature that has been brought about by cutting-edge technology is not new. We have been here before. And as in times past, it is no surprise that with each new wave of social change, upheavals are to be expected. In From Gutenberg to Google, Tom writes that it is important to understand the historical context for how technology evolves. To this end, he traces the pattern of network-driven outcomes over time and tells us that while networks may be the primary enabling force, history shows it is the secondary effects of such networks that are transformational. More specifically, it is how we react to new technology that is of primary importance. The question is, what exactly are new social, scientific, and technological advances doing to our lives? What is the history that we are making? For the answers, please join me in welcoming a very special guest, Tom Wheeler. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Joanne, and thank you, everybody, for coming out early this morning. Um, you know, I've been introduced with this book by a lot of people, but nobody who clearly had read the book and internalized it as much as Joanne did. I think I can just go straight to the Q&A because Joanne has explained it all. Um, but, uh, but thank you very much for, for your caring about the book, Joanne. So I've got with me here a copy of a tweet that went viral recently it, that listed the things that we take for granted that did not exist in 2003. Facebook, Twitter, iPhone, iPad, Android, YouTube, AWS, Apple, App Store, Uber, Airbnb, Blockchain, Bitcoin, Store, Stripe, Spotify, Dropbox, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, Pinterest, Kickstarter, Messenger, Quora, Tumblr, Hotspot, Hulu, Box, Nest, Fitbit, Oculus, Dropbox, Kindle, and 4G. That didn't exist 15 years ago. And are pretty common and defining in how we live our lives today. So technology has impacted our personal activities and also our economic activities. 
Um, robots wrote a lot of your newspaper this morning. Financial reports, sports scores, this sort of thing are being done now by computers, by artificial intelligence. Last week, Warner Music announced a 20-album deal with an algorithm. 20 albums. It's not Beyonce. It's a computer algorithm. 52%, this is a shocking statistic, 52% of the companies that were in the Fortune 500 at the turn of the century, 2000, don't exist anymore. 52%. And we are at a period where we have the highest level of wealth inequality in 100 years. No wonder. There is all of this anxiety around the country and around the world. No wonder that there is this search for stability amidst all of this change. You know, I get a kick, and we were talking at the table here. There's people go around today saying, oh, we've never seen so much change. No, baloney. And what From Gutenberg to Google is about is talking about the predicates that created where we are today. And so let me just put this in perspective. And Joanne gave you a, a, a preview of this. We talk about how we're in the middle of the information <clears throat> revolution. The first information revolution, the original information revolution, was Gutenberg's printing press, because Gutenberg picked the lock that had kept information locked away so that it could be exploited by the priestly and the powerful. And um, that helped bring the end of the feudal economy. And that also challenged the Catholic Church, who began a campaign to talk about how this information was fake news. 400 years later, the first high-speed network in the middle of the 19th century was the steam railroad. Think about it for a second. For as long as mankind had existed, geography and distance defined the human experience. Your personal experiences, your economic activities were constrained by muscle power of either your own muscles or animal power as to how far you could go. And suddenly, the railroad destroys that. And I mean suddenly. It destroyed agra the agrarian economy. Self-sufficient agriculture became corporatized agriculture. It destroyed the artisan economy that was the heart of local communities, created all kinds of fears. One of my favorite stories is in the early, some of the early uh, uh, trains uh, in the United States, going at the incredible speed of 20 miles an hour, people would take notebooks and pencils on board to see if they could write because they weren't sure their brains would be able to operate at that kind of speed. <laughs> you know. And then, boom, boom, immediately, on the heels of this 
revolution in physical speed came the first electronic network, the telegraph. And, um, and the, the, the fact that information could be available essentially everywhere at the same time, creating the monster that we live with today, which means the telegraph opened the environment where because it is possible to know a piece of information in real time, it therefore becomes essential to know that piece of information, which is why we spend our lives looking at our mobile phones. So does all this sound familiar? Social discord and economic upheaval as a result of new technologies. And these are the stories that I call the history of our future. The subtitle of the book, From Gutenberg to Google, colon, The History of Our Future. And it's rooted in two facts. One is the Darwinian evolution of technology. You know, we have this image of two guys and a dog in a garage having an epiphany, and all of a sudden, something happens. No. There is a, there is a, 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 a like I say, an evolutionary process. And the products of that evolutionary process produce upheaval and change. If you peel back the onion of internet technology, for instance, and look at its evolution, you find Johannes Gutenberg. Because the genius of Gutenberg was not a printing press. That had been done for centuries. Wood plates carefully carved out that had all of the information and were printed. Gutenberg saw information not as its collective whole, but in its smallest usable parts. And that's the concept that is behind the internet and digital code today. Break things into its smallest parts, send it out across the internet and reassemble it at the other end. That is exactly the breakthrough that Johannes Gutenberg had in the middle of the 15th century. If you follow the evolution of computer chips, you come back to the steam engine, and in particular, you come back to a man by the name of Charles Babbage, a British mathematician who, interestingly, happened to be present at the running of the first commercial trip by a railroad in the history of the world, the Stockton and Darlington Railroad in Northeast England, where this speeding locomotive, again, that was about 17 miles an hour, that speeding locomotive ran over somebody. And I don't mean to chuckle at the running over of somebody, but Babbage, who was there, invented the cow catcher to prevent that kind of thing from happening in the future. But as I say, he was a mathematician. He was, he was a, uh, a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, which meant that he had the responsibility to, um, to calculate astronomical tables, which is an awful process. Think of your multiplication tables and how we suffered through that. And, 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 and so you can imagine these large numbers being constantly calculated and the potential for error. So the process was that you would have two mathematicians do the calculation 
And then they would check their work against each other to find out if one of them had, had made a mistake. And one day, Babbage looks across the table at the guy that he's working with, and he says, I wish to God these calculations had been performed by steam. And his life changed, and he spent the rest of his life designing what today we would call a computer using gears and cogs and spokes. He left behind hundreds of pages of blueprints. He only built a small demonstration model, was never able to put the whole thing together, but it contains all the components of computing. Input, output, calculation, storage, everything that today we look at and say, that's what makes a computer. Charles Babbage did in the Victorian era. In the 1990s, the London Science Museum um, decided, well, let's see if we can build Babbage's computer. And they did, and it worked. And the interesting thing is that Babbage was then forgotten. After, when he died, he was forgotten. You know, we think of Alan Turing and, and these other great uh, pioneers in computing. They never heard of Babbage. But we can trace computing back to the steam era. And whether it is printing or, or computing, it drove significant upheaval. Printing gave us the Reformation. You know, when Gutenberg tacked his 95 theses on the church door uh, at Wittenberg, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't breakthrough theological thinking. Those ideas had been cruising around Europe with theologians for some time, but the, the thing was that those who were advocating them, their reach was only as far as their voice. Gutenberg happened to coincide with the growth of a network of commercial printers who were looking for material. And that's what took off. And of course, the Reformation only brought us decades of war. So was there upheaval from that? You bet. The um, printing press also helped the Renaissance get out of northern Italy, probably faster than it otherwise would have. We look back, you know, today on the Renaissance and say, oh, there were such beautiful things that were going on. You know, art and thought and discovery. It must have been hell to live through that period. Because everything that anybody had been taught to believe was torn asunder by new ideas that were spread by the printing press. We think about how the railroad drove the, and the, and the telegraph together drove the Industrial Revolution. To give you, as I said, it destroyed, it destroyed uh, local economies, um, it destroyed agrarian um, uh, self sufficiency. Um, it, uh, it did to the basic center of of economies and communities, what Google is doing today. It took, if, if a farmer wanted to plow in the middle of the 19th century, he went to the local blacksmiths, who were two blacksmiths performing 11 tasks, produced a plow in about 118 hours. When the raw materials were centralized in a factory, 52 men doing 97 different tasks produced the same plow in three and three quarter hours. And the railroad then took it back out to an interconnected market that destroyed the economy for local artisans such as blacksmiths. So that's the history of our future.
You know, and every, every history has a terminus, right? We are the terminus of history. Each of us are living at our own terminus of history, which means that it is now our turn. And our time has been developed by our progress down two simultaneous paths. One is ubiquitous connectivity, moving all over here, let's say, that, that moves from, it, it, it moves from the printing press to the telegraph to the telephone to ubiquitous wireless connectivity. And the other is low-cost computing that starts with our friend Charles Babbage, goes to mainframe, goes to Moore's Law, and, and chips being in everything. And we have all grown up watching these two things happen. Sometimes they would tickle each other. But now they've had sex. I think there's somebody that always chuckles when I say that in the audience. I had a call from a friend of mine who read the book. The line is in the book, by the way. There is a one-sentence paragraph that says, and then they had sex. A uh, friend of mine calls and says, how in the world did your editor ever allow that to stay in? Um, but the fact of the matter is that that combination created a new asset, created the capital asset of the 21st century, digital information. Computers, talking to computers, universally connected, have made the digital information that is exchanged the asset of the 21st century. 90%, try this one on for size, 90% of the data that exists today has been created in the last two years. We are on an exponential curve. Every single day, let me back up, there are 39 million volumes in the Library of Congress. Every single day, we produce three million libraries of Congress in terms of the data that the effect of this ubiquitous connectivity and ubiquitous computing coming together produce. You may recall that The Economist had a cover a couple of years ago in which they said that data was the new oil. Well, they were wrong. There's a huge difference between the data of the 21st century and the data that, I'm sorry, and the, and the, the asset of the 21st century and the asset, the criteria of asset that has existed throughout the history of humankind. And that is that data is inexhaustible. You can't compare it to oil. There is a limited amount of oil in the ground and there's a limited amount of supply. There's a limited amount of gold, and there's a limited amount of supply. For all of history, the assets that drove the economy have been driven by limits. And now we have an inexhaustible supply that computers, talking to computers, create new data, that creates new uh, digital, new software-driven products, that creates new data, that creates, and it becomes a, our own perpetual motion machine. And about half of that data that is created every day is data about you and me is the collection of information about our practices on a scale that Big Brother could have only imagined being delivered not by totalitarian governments like Orwell envisioned, but by capitalists. 
And that union of computing and communications leads us to what's next. Four quick things. One, the nature of our networks is changing. Network has always been, take something from A to B. When you have a network that is nothing more than connected microchips out here, suddenly the role of the network evolves to become an orchestrating activity rather than a transporting activity. Quick example. When you bring up Waze or Google Maps or whatever in your car for the connected car, that is a classic example of how a network works. Get information, bring it back, point to point. An autonomous car takes thousands of inputs to make the decision how not to hit the school bus. And all of that work is done out here in the network. These devices are this size because of the computing power that has to be in here, the chips that have to be in here. You move that computing power out into the network, and suddenly the size of this disappears, and you start seeing on your glasses, for instance, the screen displays. The nature of networks is moving from transporting to orchestrating. Secondly, artificial intelligence. We hear an awful lot about artificial intelligence. We can talk more about it if you want. But what is artificial intelligence? It is, it is the use of computing power to, 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 to create and store data and have ready access to it over the network to bring in a new algorithm does a pretty good job making a prediction. Third big change, blockchain. And I mean a lot more than Bitcoin. 40 years after Gutenberg, Luca Pacioletti, a mathematician in Venice, came up with the idea of double entry bookkeeping and Gutenberg's book, Gutenberg's printing spread it throughout Italy and then th throughout Europe. And what that enabled was two banks to know they were each keeping score the same way. And that meant that I could cash what was drawn on this bank and they would have relationships back and forth with each other. And that, because it was a matter of trust, we knew we were keeping score the same way, and that trust was what the bank sold. Same thing exists today in credit cards, right? You trust that they'll take your card, the merchant trusts that they'll get paid for it. Blockchain takes advantage of this distributed orchestrating network to move that trust out and to redefine trust. And the fourth thing that, was, that is going to define our future is cybersecurity. We, we are somehow surprised at all of the attacks, the cyber attacks we're constantly hearing about. Networks have always been attack vectors. So why should we be surprised that the network of the 21st century is an attack vector? I don't care whether it was Native Americans following animal paths to attack the tribe next door, or Caesar using a road network to conquer the world. Networks have always been attack vectors. We have a new network. Why are we surprised that it is the attack vector of the 21st century? The only thing that's surprising is we didn't think about that ahead of time, and we're now playing whack-a-mole with how we deal with cybersecurity. Now, Joanne told me that I need to be done in two minutes. And, um, and so I am going to go real fast to a couple of key points. She said that the, the it's never, she quoted the book as saying, it is never the primary network that is transformational, but is the secondary impact of that network. And I want to review four quick secondary impacts and their effect on us. And I'd be happy to talk about anything you want to talk about. The first 
is that all of this data that is being created, somehow through some form of what I call digital alchemy, your information about each of your personal lives has become a corporate asset. And that like how pre-printing information was hoarded to allow people to exert power by denying information, we now have a handful of companies that are using the hoard of that information that they have collected about you to control and dominate markets. They also use that hoard of information to target you because they're running what's called an attention economy where the more they keep you online, the more ads they can sell you, and therefore they deliver to you things you want to hear, things you want to see, things that they know as a, as a result of monitoring your activities you're interested in seeing, and that drives tribalism. The basic human instinct is tribal. Democracy calls on us to rise above tribalism in the hope that together we can do something better for everybody. But technology encourages tribalism and the economic effects of the technology discourage the, hey, if we all pull together, we can lift ourselves up. And then as a result, eat away at the underpinnings of democracy. As I said, we have the highest wealth concentration since the 1920s. Here's a statistic that will blow you away. When most of us in this room were born, the expectation was that you would grow up and earn more than your parents. A new study out shows that in 1945, those born in 1945, there was a 90% expectation and an expect reality that you would, grow, you would earn more than your parents. In 1955, that fell to 70%. In 1965, that fell to 59%. In 1975, it fell to 57%. And if you were born in 1985, there is only a 50% probability that you will end up earning more than your parents. The dichotomy in economic opportunity, the focusing and targeting of the information that has been collected about each of us is acting to destroy what our founders called e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And to produce the sense of anxiety and insecurity that we discussed at the outset. And so should we be surprised that that insecurity producing a demand for fast answers has resulted in the growth of authoritarian governments across the world? That it used to be liberal democracy was on the rise. Now authoritarianism is on the rise. Why? because they say they've got answers. Should we be surprised that we have solutions instead of, or we have slogans instead of solutions? Watch what our friends in the UK are going through right now. And you shake your head and you say, how could this slogan of Brexit be so destructive? And then we realize, well, let's see, we haven't got many 
stones to throw ourselves if we're sitting here obsessing about a wall and the president talking about shutting down trade with our largest trading partner, which will have an immediate impact on prices and the economy of this country. So the conclusion of the book is that the promise of the good old days, and we can go back to something that once was halcyon, is fake history. And that what the history of our future really teaches us is that we move forward by not retreating, but responding. And that these forces that have been moving for the last 600 years have now come together and created, us, created for us a new challenge, a new reality. And our challenge is how do we use democracy, which is inherently a slow process, and capitalism, which is inherently a, an expansive process that we previously have taken, put guardrails in place for. How do we say, all right, let's look. When the Industrial Revolution came along, we looked and we said, hey, the rules that worked for agrarian mercantilism no longer work for industrial capitalism. And we created antitrust rules, consumer protection rules, worker protection rules, and guardrails on capitalism that allowed capitalism to succeed and, in fact, protected capitalism. And we now find ourselves in a situation where the rules that had worked for, in, for, for industrial capitalism are probably no longer adequate for internet capitalism. And so our moment is not to flee, but to stand up, recognize the challenge, recognize that we've been here before, recognize that, you know, all these challenges that we're having today, they probably aren't as rough as the challenges of history. But what history does teach us is the only thing that works is to engage them. And now it's our turn, our turn, we're at our terminus of history. And the book tees up what are we going to do about that. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody. Well, I thank you for giving us the history of our future and laying the foundation for the future history. So with that being said, um, I'd like to uh, call on anyone who has a question, and I just ask that you introduce yourself and try to keep your question short and to the point. So we'll start here with Ron. Uh, Ron Berenbaum, uh, your anecdote uh, about Babbage's railroad ride reminded me of another railroad ride in Great Britain. This one was taken by a gentleman named A.C. Pigou, who was a Cambridge economist. And as he saw the railroad going high speed, whatever it was then, he saw sparks flying off the track. And he said, look, suppose one of those sparks burns down a farmhouse. He said, clearly, the price I paid for this railroad ticket doesn't represent the total cost to society of that ticket. Thus was born the idea of social costs as well as economic costs and the Pigovian tax. Uh, I realize you've touched on a lot of these issues and so on, but how do you see us recognizing and developing metrics uh, for, the, uh, for the social costs of uh, the internet or whatever it is you want to call it, and for taxing uh, the uh, negative outcomes? Wow, what a great question. How much time do we have, Joanne? 
Sponsor takes you to answer. So, so no, I, and and that actually is what I'm working on right now. So, uh, as Joanne said, I'm at, I'm at Brookings. I'm also up at the Kennedy School at Harvard, where um, where I'm I'm doing research and writing materials on this uh, on this issue. Um, it seems to me that um, that uh, well, first of all, your example is spot on. And I talk about in the book how um, when the railroad went through uh, farmlands, it was the cinders coming out of the smokestack that set fire to houses and barns and hayricks and this sort of thing. And, um, and who had responsibility for that? There was, and there was applied, an English common law concept, dating back literally to coming out of feudalism, called the duty of care. And the duty of care says that you have the responsibility to anticipate and mitigate things that are going to happen. And, um, and so the solution to the smokestack was put a screen across the top to stop the cinders. Where's the screen, quote unquote, in, um, in the information economy that exists today? You know, I ran a software company at one point in time. I can tell you that the sheer excitement of, hey, can we build? And oh my God, we got it to work. Totally overpowers, and what's the impact going to be? And so our, one of our challenges is, how do we institute the duty of care concept in this new environment. I think we have to do it legally. As I say, it is the, it is the basis for negligence uh, in the law. It is the basis for, t for fiduciary responsibilities in the law. One of the things that I had to skim over, because Joanne had me on the clock, is that, is that um, we have the, 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 the folks who are the pioneers have always made the rules. Always made the rules. I don't care whether it's our friend Mr. Carnegie, okay, or Mark Zuckerberg. They made the rules until such time as those rules began to infringe on the rights of individuals and the public interest, and then the people stepped forward. I think we're at that point now. One of the concepts that we have to have in the new rules for the new digital era is the point that you raise about a duty of care. I want to refine that a little bit and ask you. Could you introduce yourself? Please? I'm sorry, Anthony Fales. Anthony. Uh, I want you to refine that a little bit and ask you, if you're advising the President of the United States, he asked you, what are the two or three changes to this regulatory architecture we should make? What do you tell them? And, and we've seen in the, the yeah. process, Elizabeth Warren has said, let's break up tech companies. Mark Zuckerberg has even said, well, maybe we do need regulation. So the dialogue is moving this direction. What are the, the, the concrete changes we make? Well, I'm reminded of H.L. Of, of, uh, Mencken's uh, old observation at one point in time. He said, for every problem, there's a quick, easy, beautiful, simple, and wrong solution. <laughs> um, and, and so what we don't want to do is rush after. I mean, God bless Elizabeth Warren and what her suggestion is. I have a piece coming out today um, at Brookings that says um, that, um, that, that the diff there's a difficulty with antitrust enforcement in, in this era. Um, and so, uh, which basically is, it takes so long, you know, the AT&T breakup was a 10-year process. It takes so long that by the time you get to the end of it, the issue you're dealing with is no longer an issue. Technology and time have passed it by. Secondly is that, um, uh, thanks to the Federalist Society, the Chicago School dominates uh, antitrust law uh, and the judiciary, and um, and that's based on what is consumer harm, not be measured by price, not what is marketplace harm, the Brandeising and the comic con concept. 
Um, and, um, and so we probably couldn't get there even after the long 10-year fight. Therefore, I'm suggesting what we need to do is we need to, instead of break up, break open that what is it that gives these companies the, um, the power, this power in the marketplace? And it's their hoarding of this data. And how do we open that so that competitors have access to that data for compensation, which goes back to the second point. So let me just, you ask, what would I say to the president? There are three things. One, a duty of care. Two, a duty to deal, another common law concept. It's what I tried to put in place with the open internet rules, net neutrality. You know, if we go back again to, 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 to uh, the, the roots of common law, the, the, the guy running the ferry across the river had a duty to take everybody. Not for free, but had a duty to take everybody. The, the, the guy running the tavern had a duty to provide shelter and food for everybody. When the telegraph came along, the Congress in 1860, in the Pacific Telegraph Act, Section 3 said that it would be non-discriminatory. There was a duty to deal that everybody had to get on. The telephone had the same kind of concept. Everybody had to have a right to get on. When the internet comes along, the companies say, oh no, digital is different. We said, no. The same concept, the concept of net neutrality, we imposed on um, the internet service providers. The Trump administration has taken that away. So the second test would be a duty to deal. The third thing that I would recommend is that we need to rethink how we do government, how we do this oversight. You know, the, the, the company is used to, well, let me, let me, I'll give you a specific insofar as net neutrality is concerned. We had a concept in net neutrality. I, I tried to put regulatory flexibility into net neutrality because we didn't know what was coming. So I said, here are the four corners of the rules. It's based on just and reasonable activities in the marketplace. And we will empower the FCC to be a referee on the field to throw a flag when new developments don't meet that test. And the companies came in to me and said, oh, it's terrible. That's regulatory uncertainty. We don't know what to expect. Well, of course, the day before, they had been in saying, oh, you can't have strict rules because that thwarts innovation. Well, you can't have both sides of that argument, right? Um, and, um, and so, we need to have an agile form of government. I, as I said, I ran a software company at one point in time. You, you used to build software like you built cars at, at the Ford assembly plant. Did this, and did this, and did this, and it rolled off the assembly line. It was called the waterfall because it went along and whoop, fell off like a, like a waterfall. Now, software is never done. Um, you're constantly getting updates to your iPhone. Right? You're always getting updates to your operating system on your computer. It always has to change to reflect the realities of what's going on. Government needs to do that as well. I tried it three specific times, net neutrality, privacy, and cyber, all of which have been repealed by the Trump administration because of regulatory uncertainty. But we shouldn't be surprised. So, and I'll shut up here one second. But this is, I mean, this is the third thing, and it's, and, it's, and it's crucial. And it's some of the work that I'm doing now. Our government was structured in the industrial era on industrial management concepts. What were management concepts in the industrial era? Where you had a guy on the floor who followed a set of rules who was overseen by a supervisor who had a set of rules to make sure he was following the rules, who was overseen by a manager who had a set of rules to make sure that these guys. And we're surprised that we have a rules-based regulatory structure, a rules-based bureaucratic structure in our government, because that's the way everything got managed, except that's not the way the economy gets managed today. 
The economy gets managed through, through agile management. And we need to bring that kind of concept into how we oversee that economy. So those are the three things that I would say, and by the way, have said. Susan Githalton, thank you Hi, for Susan. being so provocative. Thank you, Susan. Fantastic. Now, at the outset, you said that we're living in an age of great inequality, more than in 100 years or so. So using uh, the history of our future, how did we get here, and what do you expect to be in the future? Well, we, get, well, we, we got here um, because um, the, the pioneers get to make the rules. Um, and we got here because there is a difference between the experience in the industrial era and the experience today. I mean, if your, if your buggy whip factory was put out of business in the industrial era, you didn't really need a new set of skills to go down the street and go to work for Henry Ford. Okay. Um, today, There are two, two types of skill sets, those who can deal with technology and those who can't. The first get paid well, the second don't. Those who have invested in, developed the, the first kind of the technology-based companies themselves get rewarded. We need to, to come to grips with how are we going to make sure that in a rapidly changing world, um, we have people who are capable of moving from one side to the other. One of the things I talk about in the book is that Randall Stevenson, the CEO of AT&T, told his people that they have to spend five or 10 hours a week, a week in training in order to keep their jobs. This is in addition to their 40 hour week but that things are changing so fast that if you don't keep up with the technology, you will not be employable. So you ask yourself the question, uh, and I ask this in the book. Um, we went from the 60-hour week to the 40-hour week. Um, is it time to ask the question, okay, so should we think about a 30-hour week so that, it, that includes 10 hours, that, that to, onto which is added 10 hours of training so people are continually uh, uh, trained, and by the way, that other 10 hours ends up becoming an opportunity for, um, for others to have jobs. Uh, and so we have, to, we have to think our way through this process and we have to think anew. And the, and the, the challenge is you don't, solve old pro you don't solve new problems with old solutions. The, 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 the danger in this book, the thing that I worry about in this book and try to bend over backwards to avoid is, is well, apply the lessons of history. You can't. Okay, do, we did this in the industrial era, therefore we do this now, doesn't work. But we, we, we thought creatively as to how to meet our challenges in the industrial era is the same. We need to think creatively how to meet our challenges in, the, in this area. We need to have that as a public debate. And back to your point, sir. Elizabeth Warren and others, fortunately, are starting to foment that discussion. Um, Bob. Uh, Bob Fry, thank you very much. Uh, you've said a lot of things today which are obviously very important to hear. What would you consider to be, because I think your book is a warning, clear warning, dealing tomorrow, future. What is the, in a, in a way, I think analogously, your book is like the cow catcher. <laughs> I'll take that, Bob. Thank you. Okay. So where do you go with that? Um, Bob, this is actually what I laid in bed last night thinking about. Um, and that is that um, 
the kinds of things that I talked about uh, at the end of my presentation, the kind of things we just talked about here, um, I got to do another book that addresses that question. <laughs> but this is what I'm working on at Brookings at Harvard. And, um, and this is what's exciting. And uh, you know, one of the things, and I don't want to become too Pollyannish about this, folks. But you know, I talk about we're at the terminus of, of history. How lucky we are. My god, look at the challenges we get to deal with. I, and I quote in the book the wonderful line from Hamilton where uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda has Elizabeth Schuyler says, look around, look around, how lucky we are to be alive right now, dot, 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 revolution. OK, it's a question of what are you going to do? And I'm, Bob, I'm, I hope to be back to the Carnegie Council in the relatively near future and address that. I was going to ask, uh, what keeps you up at night? Now you know. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my name is Teak Wigan. So um, it seems to be two fears about automation these days, two, two consequences in particular. Um, mass job displacement, right. but also permanent mass unemployment, which are different. Um, a, do you think those fears are overblown? And then uh, B, it seems like they're periodic waves of fears about automation producing these two effects. And, they've proven to be overblown in the past. Could you review briefly some of those peak periods yeah. where everyone was freaking out about automation? So uh, thank you. Good question. Um, very real, but we're in control. These things will only happen if we sit on our hands. Um, there is quoted in the book uh, a speech that JFK made in the 1960s about the threat that computers were posing to, uh, to, uh, to workers. Um, and, um, and, and so, so um, the, I had a meeting with the Argentinian um, Secretary of Communications, um, in which his opening line was, well, what about the 47% of the people that an Oxford study says are going to be put out of work as a result of, of automation? And, um, and my response was, again, what I said a minute ago, it's only uh, if we sit on our hands. Um, how many remember uh, a space, 2001 A Space Odyssey? Right? Remember that movie? Right? And the computer, how? By the way, how did it get the name Hal? IBM. Bingo. It is the, it is the letters immediately preceding IBM. Um, and the computer Hal is going to take over this space mission. And there's one astronaut who is up and, and not, uh, not uh, put into hibernation, and that's Dave. And Dave and the computer start, and Hal start going back and forth. And Dave finally does what? He unplugs Hal. Okay. We're still running this. There's a, I don't know how many of you have read, have read Sapiens. Um, terrific book um, in which he observes that there are only two animals that have been successfully domesticated by man. One is the horse and the other is the dog. And the difference between the horse and the dog is that the dog has also domesticated mankind okay and my dog when my dog hops up on my bed at night and I go oh you're the world's best dog and I'm saying to myself now let's see who has domesticated whom here <laughs> right um, it holds you know we have to domesticate AI we will if we are vigilant if we don't sit on our hands and, um, and that's our challenge. Well, I thank you so much for Joanne, the challenge. Joanne, thank us. you, everybody, very and much. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you.